Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday, I bring you these videos to keep you in the loop about Starship development, launch news, and everything else spaceflight. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today, from the ever-busy activities around Starbase, big news from Tori Bruno and Blue Origin, a Chinese rocket spinning uncontrollably over the Indian Ocean, and much, much more. Let's roll the intro, kicking things off with Starship Talk. It's all business as usual down at Boca Chica, Texas. SpaceX are really ramping things up ahead of the orbital flight test, though the exact date of this is now a little uncertain, or at least a little more uncertain than it was before. This is because Booster 7 remains in the Mega Bay undergoing inspection and repairs, and still not a lot is really known about its status, and that certainly hasn't changed much in the past seven days. A number of Raptor engines have been removed from it, but yeah, that's about it as far as we know. Here you can see it next to a fully stacked Booster 8, and it remains to be seen if SpaceX are going to try and fix Booster 7 and fly it with Ship 24, or if they'll salvage what they can and then use Booster 8 for the flight. I'm sure we'll learn more about the future of these two boosters over the course of the next week or so. Over at the launch site on the 21st of July, Booster 7.1 was tested to failure. You can see it buckle in this shot from Lab Padre here. It's very normal for things to get tested to failure. Take a look at the remains of this SLS core stage as an example. Hopefully this test tank failed well beyond the stresses expected during normal operation. There's been a good deal of progress on some of the buildings at Starbase as well. As you can see, the permanent Star Factory building is really starting to come together with walls and roofing in place. I don't think it's going to be very long at all before SpaceX start using this building for works, and that's only if they haven't started using it already. Take a look at the Mega Bay. In the hollow bit above the main hangar, you can see this white band in place now. These are the support beams for the large glass windows that will eventually be installed inside the Mega Bay in much the same way as we've seen with the High Bay. Back to the Star Factory building shot I showed you a second ago, take a look at the tent to the left of it. This is tent number three, and on the 16th of July, we saw the aft section of Starship Ship 26 rolled out. Ship 26 is one of three known vehicles currently under construction at Boca Chica, along with Ship 25 and Ship 27, which are all in various stages of fabrication, as shown in Brendan Lewis's latest production overview diagram. Now, CSI Starbase caught this rather weird crane lift on Lab Padre's stream. Here, we can see the Booster 9 methane tank being lifted in two sections. Look at that gap! <laughs> We're not quite sure what's going on here. Perhaps over the next few days, more information will emerge about this. But I'm a bit stumped on the benefit of lifting the booster like this. Or, you know, Elon's motto has always been, the best part is no part. So maybe SpaceX are trying to delete some of the rings of the booster. Anyone? Anyone think I'm onto something here? But hey, that's just a theory, a Starship theory. Okay, I, I did that joke last week. I, I'm sorry. It's just, I worked really hard on this image, you know? Like, subscribe, quality content. Hmm? Okay, shilling aside, over at the Kennedy Starbase site, we saw the rollout of Section 5 of the Starbase Orbital Launch Tower, where it was rolled to Pad 39A for stacking. This particular section of the tower is where the cryogenic propellants are loaded into the Starship vehicle. And with the stacking of this piece complete, the launch tower at Kennedy is now past the halfway point in terms of its total height. Some big congratulations to Joe Barnard are in order. About seven years ago, he started on a journey to propulsively land a model rocket Falcon 9 style, having no background in aerospace, engineering, coding, or anything really. And last week on the 24th of July, he proudly announced that his scout rocket had finally managed to stick the landing. Not long after, he published this amazing onboard footage of the landing as well. I am fully expecting him to publish a full video on his YouTube channel of the full flight with various different camera angles, so go subscribe so that you don't miss this. It's gonna be awesome. Anyway, yes, congratulations to Joe once again. So, you know, is it gonna be back to carbonating milk now then? <laughs> we had another big launch success, this time over in China. On the 27th of July, we saw the maiden launch of the ZK-1A, also known as the Lijian-1 launch vehicle. The rocket is produced by CAS Space, a commercial spin-off of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. This is their first solid fuel launch vehicle, which stands at 30 meters tall and is 2.65 meters in diameter and consists of four all solid fuel stages. The rocket is capable of lifting 1.5 tons of payloads to sun-synchronous orbit. During last week's launch, it successfully placed six satellites into orbit, all of varying purposes from technology demonstration, electromagnetic research, atmospheric research, quantum key distribution, and science popularization. 
the launch was a success, and all satellites are now operational. This launch makes the ZK-1A the largest operational solid-fueled rocket in China. On the 29th of July, we had another launch from China, this time a Long March 2D. This carried three Yaogan-35 satellites to low Earth orbit. This is the third launch we've seen for Yaogan-35, which is a reconnaissance satellite of which we know relatively little about. It's considered to be a relatively new type of satellite, so it'll probably take some time before its intended purpose becomes clear. Last week we had some very big news from United Launch Alliance. Yes, we now have a photograph of the very first flight-ready BE-4 engine. And man, that's a lot of plumbing. <laughs> Tori Bruno shared an image of BE-4 Flight Engine 1 being lifted into the stand at the Blue Origin factory. Here's a wider image here. The completed engine is on the left, and the engine to the right is the nearly finished engine number two. These two engines will power the first stage of the maiden flight of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, which of course will eventually replace their Atlas and Delta line of launch vehicles. Hopefully this is a sign that we should see this launch happen very soon. I can't wait to see it. More Chinese rocket launch news now. Last week, we talked about the launch of the Wentian Laboratory Module, which will serve not only as a laboratory module for the Tiangong Space Station, but will also provide additional navigation avionics, propulsion, and orientation control that'll serve as backup functions for the Tianhe Core Module. It successfully docked to the space station last week, and we saw the crew of the space station successfully board it to begin setup operations. Now, this isn't really the main reason I'm bringing this up. You see, the laboratory launched on a Long March 5B rocket, which has the very exciting issue, I mean feature, of where in the world is the gigantic core stage going to hurtle into upon re-entry bingo? Vote now on your phones. <laughs> well, late on Saturday, the 23 metric ton core stage crashed back down to Earth over the Indian Ocean. Unlike the core stages of most rockets, which are either steered to a safe crash zone shortly after liftoff, or in the case of Falcon 9, are brought to a controlled landing for future reuse. And this is not the case with Long March 5. The core stage enters orbit with its payload, and then it just sort of stays up there until atmospheric drag catches it and sends it down to Earth in an unpredictable and uncontrolled fashion. So it really is a complete gamble where it's going to end up. One observer caught this video from Kuching in Malaysia. While we hope that the rocket harmlessly splashed down into the ocean, it's not impossible that debris could have hit populated areas. This issue is one area of admittedly quite a few in which the Chinese space agency really needs to step their game up. This is really not very safe practice. I really like this cool footage here. So, so awesome. I love watching it. No real reason I'm showing it to you though, other than to provide a nice aesthetically pleasing background while I give a massive thanks to all my Patreon supporters and channel members. Their names are now on screen. Without their financial support, I wouldn't be able to make these videos, so thank you all so much for your continued generosity. If you want to sign up, then you know how, but otherwise there are two video suggestions on screen. Hopefully they're good picks. Everyone, thank you all so much for watching. I'll catch you all next time.